HOAs are a pain in the ass. Homeowners associations I'm talking about. And I'm kind of wondering if that's where Russell C. Connor was sitting in one of those meetings when he came up with the idea for Between. If he was sitting in one of those HOA meetings, loathing it, hating the meeting, and just thinking about the carnage he wishes he could inflict in that meeting. So that's what we're reading from today is Russell C. Connor's Between and the deformed creatures, monsters that come out of the woods and just totally wreak havoc on a tiny community and the HOA that kind of governs it all. So let's go ahead and dive into Between by Russell C. Connor. Let's get it started. Hey, thanks for joining me again on First Chapter Freak Show. This is episode 25, and I am horror author Carver Pike. As you're watching this, I'm either on my way right now to the Naughty Nashville event, or I'm already there. So uh, this is pre-recorded. I wanted to have something for you guys to watch. I know last week I only put up one episode. This week I'll probably only have one episode, too. Like I said, this is pre-recorded. I'm going to try to squeeze in one more, but I think this is probably the only one that I'll get to. Um, as I mentioned in the last episode, some of the medications that I'm taking and stuff right now for uh, headaches and some other stuff I've got going on that have a, kind of um, made it hard to get in the right mind frame for work. Um, even right now as I'm recording this, again, some of the medicines are just kind of making me a little bit loopy. So I'm um, trying to stay enthusiastic and stuff for this. Uh, so hopefully I can make it through this and, and it'll still be entertaining and everything for you guys. Doing my best here. But um, like I said, I, I will have this one out for you guys to watch while I'm on the road. So I am going to be reading from Russell C. Connors um, Between. And I'm super excited about that one. We'll be getting to that soon. So like I said, I'm on my way to Nashville or I'm already there. Um, hopefully I'll be seeing some of you guys there. I know Stacy Stewart, you, you're coming there just to see me. I mentioned bringing your son. I think that's super cool. Um uh, I think a few people are coming there that, that watch the show and stuff like that. So hopefully I'll see some of you guys there and you'll come back and watch the show later on. I am still doing the Haunted Majestic signing in Huntington, West Virginia on October 30th. So I hope to see some of you there. Also, uh, if you want to know more about that, make sure, sure you go to the hauntedmajestic.com and uh, get more information about that signing there. And... Uh, uh, let me see here. Oh, as always, make sure you don't have little ones in the room or that you have earbuds in so that, uh, you know, little ears don't hear things they shouldn't. I don't know um, too much about Russell Connor's uh, writing style, so I don't know if he drops the F-bomb quite often. But, you know, as the host here, I, I do kind of use foul language quite often. So uh, I apologize in advance for anything that someone might have already heard. But make sure you pop, plop in those earbuds and, um, you know, so we can protect those little ears and stuff. So if this is your first time watching me, I like to read my horror author friend's books, just the first chapter or the prologue first chapter, maybe the first and second, depending on how long the chapters are, so that you can get a taste of an author who might be new to you. Um, usually these are not new authors. Sometimes they are, but maybe new to you, an author that you haven't tried out yet. And, um, you know, maybe you'll like what you hear. You go check out their work on Amazon or wherever their work may be sold. Um, you know, skim through it, check the grammar and stuff, make sure that you're okay with how they write and stuff like that. And, um, you know, maybe you'll choose to continue on that relationship with the author and hopefully that's what you do and you buy the book and love it and you guys will continue and reader author relationship going forward. Um, that's what I always hope for. So that's what this is all about. So let me see. Um, I think that's about all I have. Oh, the mat. So my book, The Mad Name, the last book in the Diablo Snuff series, is still on pre-order at this time. It will go live to your Kindles on October 20th if you pre-order it. The paperback will be coming out right around the same time. So that's coming up super soon. We are in October already, so that's coming up very soon. I'm really excited about that, and I can't wait to hear what you think about that book. So please go pick up a copy of The Maddening. Make sure you've read the other books in the series first, though. That is uh, A Foreign Evil, um, The Grindhouse, Passion and Pain, and Slaughterbox. Make sure you've read those before you read The Maddening, because it does touch on all those other books in the series in some way. Those can be read really in any order, 
but you want to read the maddening last. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Russell C. Connor, straight from his author bio. Russell C. Connor has been writing about demons, serial killers, and the end of the world since he was five years old. His short work has appeared in Black Petals magazine, Alien Skin, and Sanitarium, among others. He currently has 14 novels available, including The Supernatural, Crime Noir, Finding Misery, and the Amazon bestseller Good Neighbors, which won both an IPPY and a Reader's Favorite Award for Horror. He lives in Fort Worth, Texas with his Mistress of the Dark, Demon Spawn Daughter, I love that, Rabid Dog, and extensive movie collection. So I can tell you that Russell C. Connor first caught my eye um, when I picked up a book, I think it was in the, in one of the BookBub newsletters, or it might have just been randomly looking on Amazon, I can't remember. Um, but I found one of his books called Sargasso. Uh, it had something to do with the Bermuda Triangle, and um, just the cover was awesome. It had like a skull with the Bermuda Triangle behind it. And um, it's probably one of my favorite covers. I've mentioned it before when like somebody asked me about some of my favorite covers, some of my favorite book covers. And um, so... So yeah, so that was, I've mentioned before about that being one of my favorite book covers. And um, so when we started talking about reading one of his books on the show, I actually mentioned that book, but he wanted me to read Between. He really uh, thought this would be a good one because it's got a good, great first chapter to read to you guys. So um, so that's when he first caught my attention. And um, so I was excited to have him on the show and I'm excited to read this to you guys. Uh, if you go look at his Amazon page, I think he said, I just read that he had 14 novels. I was going to say, if you go to Amazon and, and scroll through, you can see he has quite the collection of work. So. But today I am reading from between, so let me go ahead and read that blurb to you. So right off the top, he's got a couple, a few five-star kind of blurbs, like reviews right at the top. It says, five-star, perfect mix of horror, humor, action, and characters that you feel connected to. Five-star, the monsters were incredible. And five-star, horror at its finest, on all caps. As president of the Homeowners Association, Mitch Flynn expected a long night of, set of settling petty disputes between the residents of Country Road 407. But when a charred man in a lab coat shows up, the monthly HOA meeting takes a much darker turn. Because the night outside their tiny community center is suddenly full of creatures from the depths of a nightmare. Deformed monsters that seem to come from strange shimmering lights in the woods. Mitch and his band of feuding neighbors must face down this horde if they want to survive. That is, if they can keep from killing one another first. Now, this is a 338-page 338, 338 book, so it's not a short story or novella. So I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that to you, too. So um, there was something else that I missed up here. I was going to tell you where to go. Hold on. Uh, sorry, hold on. <clears throat> oh, okay. Hold on. I was also going to tell you that um that I know Russell C. Connor, Connor also has a new post-apocalyptic trilogy called Some Say in Fire uh, coming out in December. So I'll drop the link to that in the YouTube description below. I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that. I knew I had that here in the notes, but I had somehow skipped over that when I was reading the blurb. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and read the first chapter of Between to you guys, and then um, we'll get to the Wheel of Horror and see who's next. All right, I'm just going to take these glasses off here while I read. All right, chapter one. Roberta spotted the man in the white coat first as he stumbled through the shaggy grass lining the edge of Country Road 407 with his back to them. She turned down the sweet sounds of George Strait crooning on the radio, jabbed a blunt finger at the windshield, and asked, Honey, who's that? J.D. Miller squinted over the Tahoe steering wheel. Beyond the blazing cones of the truck's headlights, the slivered October moon dusted the land with a cold glaze, just enough to crisp the outline of the sparsely wooded fields as they rolled past without giving any real definition to anything beyond the glass. The darkness allowed a billion stars to glow overhead, but he didn't know how his wife could possibly see. Wait. There. The shape of a long, square-shouldered jacket floated through the gloom on the right side of the road ahead, visible only because of the night's contrast against its glaring white surface. 
The figure's dark head and hands and lower half blended in with the surroundings, making it look like the invisible man out for a stroll. Don't know, J.D. answered. But that looks like some sort of hospital get-up. Hospital get-up? You know, like a doctor coat. Oh, well, maybe it's Doc then? J.D. shook his head. If it had been the veterinarian whose property boarded the tail end of CR-407, they would have recognized him even from this distance. The man weighed over 300 pounds. His backside would have been as broad as a blimp. Nope, probably just an escaped mental patient. Gonna sneak in your window tonight and get a little nookie. He put a hand on, on the wide thigh of her jeans and squeezed. Oh, goody. Let's see if he can get the job done without falling asleep halfway through. <laughs> she gave him a teasing smirk and slapped his hand away then leaned forward to peer through the windshield again. Who'd be out here in the dark without even a flashlight? J.D. shrugged. Couldn't be that much of a mystery. 407 was a dead-end road, branching off a Bear Creek Parkway far behind them. The only traffic this hidden slice of heaven ever saw came from those fortunate enough to live on it. At this point in its long, winding course, the closest house was the Austin split-level ranch about a quarter mile back but they'd already shuttered it for the winter and lit out for their home in Phoenix. Ahead, empty core of engineering land stretched for a few acres before you hit the last run of properties in the empty Texas hill country beyond. So, more than likely, the person coming up on the shoulder was one of the neighbors out walking in the dark while wearing a knee-length butcher-style coat for some reason. Heck, maybe he was even heading to the same place as them. Just a neighbor, a familiar face. All the same, an uneasy worm inched in, un, all the same, an uneasy worm inched its way up J.D.'s spine. As they approached, their headlights finally washed over the figure, giving his backside more detail. A scrawny build, maybe a buck fifty on weight, if that. Gray pants of some rough weave, black loafers, short brown hair. He took small, halting steps along the right side of the road with shoulders hunched, one arm wrapped around his middle, and the other hanging limp. Their headlights threw the man's shadow out long in front of him, but he gave no reaction. J.D. still didn't recognize the guy, but, then again, he didn't make a habit of memorizing what his neighbors looked like from behind. As George Strait gave way to Willie Nelson on the radio, he slowed the truck and swung far over to the left until the driver's side tires departed the loose gravel of the narrow road, and rolled through the grass. What are you doing? Roberta asked. What's it look like? I'm going around him. Hold on, he might need help. Roberta Miller, ever the philanthropist, she must be sponsoring a dozen Ethiopian children these days, feeding them all for just pennies per day. I'm sure he's fine, Berta. I don't know, he looks hurt. We can't just leave him without checking. JD glanced at the dashboard clock, 7-12. She delayed him half hour by taking so long to get ready, and now she wanted to play Good Samaritan. We're late enough as it is. I promised Mitch we would be there. She flapped a dismissive hand. Mitch is a big boy. He became president of the HOA all by himself, and he can handle one meeting without you there. Yeah, but you know what's on the agenda tonight. He needs all the support he can get. Roberta looked at him in the dark truck cab with eyes narrowed and jaw set. John Delbert, you pull up next to this man so I can talk to him. Go on now. It'll take only it'll only take a sec. JD sighed and pressed the brake as they came abreast of the figure on the roadside. The white garment definitely looked like a doctor coat. But now that they were so close, he could see that ragged holes and dirt stains covered the back. No, not dirt. They were too black for that. In fact, they looked more like scorch marks. The worm moved again up his neck and onto his scalp, making the hair bristle. Roberta either didn't notice or remained unfazed. She pressed the button to roll down her window and poked her head out. Excuse me, sir, are you all ru The figure's head came up and slowly swiveled to face them. JD's wife gave a tiny screech and jerked back inside the truck. The entire left side of the man's face was burned, melted ruin was a burned, melted ruin, the flesh mottled red and boil-ridden, the nose charred, 
the hair along his temple singed, one eyelid, look, eyelid looked seared shut, the other widened when it registered their presence. His mouth opened, the lips peeling back to reveal blackened gums, and he garbled something that was lost under the growl of the engine. He raised the arm wrapped around his midsection and clutched at the open window. Flakes of cooked skin stuck to the door wherever he made contact. Roberta screamed long and loud this time. J.D.'s foot came off the brake for only a moment, more from shock than an attempt to flee, but it caused them to lurch forward. The man beside the vehicle was yanked off his feet and fell out of sight. J.D.'s knuckles whitened on the steering wheel as he waited to see if he would get back up. Oh, my Lord! Oh, sweet heavens! Roberta's hand fluttered at her chest between her massive breasts. Where? J.D. stopped, swallowed a hard lump of saliva. Where'd he go? Did we run him over? I don't know. Well, look, woman! It took her several seconds to work up the nerve, but then she eased her head out once more and started downward. Finally, she declared, I don't think you hit him, but, but he ain't moving. J.D. threw the truck into park and remembered to flip on the hazards as he opened his door and jumped from the cab. The cool October night slapped him in the face after the warmth inside the Tahoe. His breath left a contrail as he ran, ran around the front of the vehicle, where clouds of road dust swirled through the headlights. He slowed as he reached the passenger side and eased cautiously around the bumper. The man in the white coat lay face down beside the truck, sprawled half across the gravel and half in the grass. They hadn't run him over, but it was a close thing. If they rolled so, mo so much as another foot forward, they'd have been washing brains out of the Tahoe's rear tire treads. Buddy, you um, you all right? J.D. approached as gingerly as he would a wild animal. When the man gave no response, J.D. knelt, grabbed one shoulder and rolled him over gently, out of the way of the truck's wheel. Even through the man's burnt jacket and the collared blue shirt beneath, J.D. could feel the flesh crinkle and crunch under his hand, like the charred shell of a roasted marshmallow. He wiped his palm on the leg of his jeans. From above him, Roberta asked, Is... is he... He's alive, I think. The man's good eye was now also closed, but his chest rose and fell, the breaths too shallow, too, crystal, too crystallized in the chilly air. Wait, his breaths too shallow to crystallize in the chilly air. Hard to tell with all the damage to his face, but J.D. didn't think he was one of the neighbors after all. Those scorch marks were all over his clothing, and wispy tendrils of smoke still rose from, from a few of them. The smell of burnt hair and well-done meat made J.D.'s gorge rise. He noticed a rectangle of plastic clipped to the breast pocket of the lab coat, but couldn't read it in the dark. Get my phone. Call 911. Roberta turned in her seat and rummaged through the center console. J.D. stayed hunkered beside the prone figure, wanting to try rousing the man again, but unable to bring himself to touch that blistered flesh. Jesus, what could have done so much damage to him? A high chittering sound from behind tore his attention away. He rose and spun. Just a few yards from the edge of the road lay the wire fence that formed the boundary of the core land. Beyond that, the grass grew tall and wild for a short stretch before turning into dense wood woodland. The boughs of the first oaks and ash trees, still full from this year's mild autumn temperatures, were visible only as vague silhouettes against the stars. J.D. peered into the night, whose darkness now le seemed less comforting and more ominous. The noise came again from the left, closer this time, a grinding chirp, almost angry sounding. It could have been a squirrel or chipmunk, except such critters were already sheltered for the night, hiding from owls and snakes on the hunt. J.D. took a step forward, squinting into the grass, and then the hip-high weeds on the other side of the fence rattled and shook as something bolted through them, making for the tree line. J.D. gasped and stepped away, bumping into the body behind him. It had been a hell of a lot bigger than a squirrel, huge enough for him to hear its footfalls. J.D. couldn't think of any animal around here big enough to make a racket like that. He didn't realize how creeped out he'd become until Roberta grabbed his arm, sending an electric bolt of shock through him. It's not working, she said, squeezing her wide shoulders through the truck window. 
What's not? Your damn phone. It just keeps beeping. Then you're doing something wrong, woman. JD took the device from her and looked at the screen. Full signal bars showed in the corner. They never had any problem with reception, even way out here. He dialed 911 and hit send, but his phone just gave a series of rapid tones before disconnecting. Told you, Roberta sounded reproachful. Re yeah, Roberta sounded reproachful, but her eyes looked large and glassy in the dimness. What do we do? JD looked both ways up 407, hoping to see approaching headlights. Someone else that could offer an opinion, but they were still alone. Come on, he finally said. Grab his feet and help me lift him into the back of the truck. I'm not touching him. Horror swept over his wife's face. Apparently, it was all right to be Mother Teresa as long as the lepers weren't too gross. Fine. He went to open the tailgate. You can stay here with him while I go get help. She glared at him again, but reluctantly got out of the truck. JD let her grab the man's ankles while he slid, arm, slid arms under his shoulders. Together, they managed to get him off the ground and onto the truck's bed. He moaned once, but didn't stir. You want to drive... <clears throat> You want to drive him all you want to drive him all the way to town? JD shook his head as he raised the tailgate. It would take us an hour. Can't let him rattle and roll in the truck bed that long, especially not with it this cold out. Community center's just 10 minutes further. We can use someone else's phone to call for help. And maybe Gladys can do something for him until we can get an ambulance. And of course, Mitch would be there. He would know what to do. Always had, ever since they were in high school. The world just made sense to J.D. when Mitchell Flynn was in charge of it. Roberta climbed back inside the truck of the passenger side. On the passenger side. J.D. went to his door, but spared one last glance at the dark core land before ducking into the cab. As he popped the transmission into drive and steered them along the meandering path of 407 once again, he noticed an interesting thing. The radio, still turned low, now played only the hiss of static. Alright, that was the end of chapter one. That's pretty cool. I like those kind of creature feature type of books. And the skittering and stuff like that, so... I'm interested to see where this is going to go. So I've got that loaded up on my Kindle. I've got the whole book on there, so... I actually started reading it last night. Um... So yeah, I'm going to keep going with that one. And uh, thank you, Russell, for trusting me with your words, man. Hopefully you guys liked what you heard. Sorry I stumbled a little bit over it. Um, definitely wasn't the writing. It had nothing to do with that. I told you it was just the, the medication and stuff I'm on. So, um, But thank you so much for trusting me with your words. I liked what I read a lot. Hopefully you guys did too. Um, make sure you check the description, the YouTube description. I'll have all of Russell's uh, information down below. So you can check out his links and stuff there. Check out his Amazon page. Um, I'll have the link for his uh, his new trilogy, post-apocalyptic stuff, uh, down below too. Uh, all my work, the links to my work will be down there as well. So let's go ahead and go to the Wheel of Horror so I can see who we'll be reading from in the next episode. Looks like the next one will be You Only Get One Shot by J.C. Michael and Kevin J. Kennedy. You Only Get One Shot by J.C. Michael and Kevin J. Kennedy will be on the next episode. And replacing that one on the wheel will be Candace Nola's Hank Flynn. I'm a good friend of Candace Nola. She is awesome. So Hank Flynn will be replacing them on the wheel. That is great news. If you want me to read from your book and you want to be added to the list that will eventually get you on the wheel, just make sure you send me an email at carverpike at gmail.com or reach out to me on Facebook. It, you know, just send me a message on Facebook and we'll get you added to that wheel. And then, you know, as I keep adding people, you'll move up the, the list and then get onto the wheel and we'll get you added there and, and eventually read your work here on the show. If you are a horror author or an aspiring author or a horror reader, please check out the Written in Red podcast that I do with my buddies Aaron Beauregard, Daniel J. Volpe, and Roland Bercy Jr. Um, I have the YouTube version link in the YouTube description of this video down below. And you can also listen to the podcast pretty much anywhere that you listen to podcasts. So please check that out. It's really cool. Also, please like this video, subscribe to it, all that kind of stuff. Share it with your friends um, so we can keep getting more and more subscribers and growing uh, viewership. So 
All that stuff helps. Thank you so much, and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.